another outrageous integral that we're going to solve using contour integration. So let's call our integral i, and before defining our contour, let's make use of Euler's formula to make the integral look more hospitable. So it uh, it goes like this, that if you have e to the i times t, then this equals the cosine of t plus i times the sine of t. And up here, we have the cosine of the sine of x. So this gives us a hint that why not try e to the i times sine of x. And this gives us the cosine of the sine of x plus i times the sine of the sine of x. And we're only interested in this part, right, which is the real part of this complex exponential function. So this makes our job considerably easy because that allows us to deal with two exponential terms rather than an exponential multiplied by a trig term. So this integral equals the real part of the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the cosine of x times e to the i times sine of x divided by 1 plus x squared. And this can be written as the real part of the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the because these two are being multiplied, you can add up their arguments. So e to the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x divided by 1 plus x squared dx. And once again, recalling Euler's formula, this is in fact e to the i x, right? So we can write this as the real part of the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the e to the i x divided by 1 plus x squared. So the corresponding function in the complex world is f of z equals e to the e to the i z divided by 1 plus z squared. And we can use uh, Cauchy's residue theorem to integrate f of z along some closed contour c and that equals 2 pi i times the sum of residues of the function f of z enclosed by the contour. So <clears throat> which contour should we use? Well, let's try the semicircular contour, the classic semicircular contour. So the complex plane where the x-axis represents the real part of the complex numbers and the y-axis represents the imaginary part, we define a semicircle of radius r in the upper half of the complex plane. And this is, of course, traversed in the anti-clockwise sense, correct? So what poles of the function f of z are enclosed by this, uh, by this contour? Well, f of z equals e to the e to the i z divided by 1 plus z squared. So we see we have a singularity we have singularities at positive and negative i, where the only useful one here is the positive case because our contour lies in the upper half of the complex plane. So positive i is 1 on the imaginary axis. So the integral over the closed contour c equals 2 pi i times, uh, no need of a sum notation here because we only have one residue. So we have one residue to calculate. So, and because this is a simple pole, the residue evaluates to the limit as z approaches i of z minus i times f of z. And the denominator here in f of z can be factored in the complex world to be z minus i times z plus i. And we see these factors canceling out. So we have to evaluate the limit as z approaches i of e to the e to the i z divided by z plus i, which gives you, of course, 2 pi i times e to the e to the i squared divided by i plus i, which is 2 pi i times i squared is negative 1, of course, and you have 2 i downstairs. So you cancel out some terms, and you're left with uh, the integral over the closed contour c being pi times e to the e to the negative 1. Now that we have this result, we can break down the contour. The integral over the closed contour c equals the integral over, uh, well, the integral from negative r to positive r on the real axis, oh, sorry about that, plus an integral over the semicircle gamma. 
And we know that this result evaluates to this result here that can be written as pi times e to the 1 by e instead of e to the negative 1. And we're interested in the limiting case of r going to infinity, in which case the integral along the real axis is our integral of interest. And we have to now evaluate the integral over the uh, semicircle gamma. So this integral, the integral over gamma, can be written as the integral from, now look, any complex number z on the semicircle can be represented in polar form as r times e to the i phi, where phi is traversed from 0 to pi radians. And the differential element in this case transforms as i times r times e to the i phi d phi. So this is the integral from 0 to, zero to pi of e to the e to the i z, and z in this case is r times e to the i phi divided by 1 plus r squared times e to the 2 phi times i times r times e to the i phi d phi. And wow, those are a lot of exponentials to work with. So my strategy here will be to first evaluate this term and then plug in the results as the argument of this exponential function here. So let's evaluate um, e to the i r e to the i phi, which using Euler's formula can be written as e to the i r times the cosine of phi plus i times the sine of phi. And multiplying this out will give you i r uh, cosine of phi. And i times i is i squared, which is negative 1. So this evaluates to negative r times the sine of phi, which we can, of course, write as the product of two exponential functions. So we have e to the i r cosine phi times e to the negative r sine phi. And again, notice that we have e to the i times some real number. So we can once again employ Euler's formula and write this as the cosine of that real number, which is r cosine phi, plus i times the sine of that uh, real number, which is r cosine phi. And all of this is being multiplied by e to the negative r sine phi. So multiplying this out, we get e to the negative r sine phi cosine r cosine phi plus i times e to the negative r sine phi times the sine of r cosine phi. Now this is the left hand side, which and now this is the uh, the left hand side was e to the i r e to the i phi, and we had to plug in the results as the argument of another exponential function. So again, we can write this as the product of two exponential functions. So let me just write it up here. Okay, cool. And uh, I really do not feel the need to, but no, wait, I should, I should, I should. Once again, employ Euler's formula. Rather, I really don't want to. Let's be honest, I really don't want to. And to be honest, there is no need for that anyway, as we will see when we take the modulus. Now, what I'm going to do is employ that really useful theorem that if you take the modulus of the integral over some contour gamma of a complex value function f, then that is less than or equal to the modulus of the, uh, sorry about that, the integral over gamma of the modulus of the complex value function f. Now, after all of this hard labor, we can plug in the results into our integral. So let me just erase some of this and uh, move some of this towards the right because I'm going to need the space. And I'm going to copy all of this. Okay, yeah, so copy and paste the results in here. Need some adjustment. And... Uh, just a bit more. Yeah, there you go. So <laughs> that looks pretty damn exotic, to be honest. So we have all of this 
equal to the integral over the contour gamma. And using that theorem, uh, using the result I just wrote out earlier, taking the modulus and then shifting it inside the integral transforms the equality into an inequality of being less than or equal to. Okay, cool. And we know that the modulus operator distributes can be distributed uh, over products and uh, rational expressions. So let me just write this separately, highlight it in green, and I'm going to need some more space again. So, okay, this is going to be a bit difficult to work out, but yeah, that's enough. So modulus, 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 modulus. Okay, so e to the i times some real number, once you take the modulus, you'll always get 1. So let's just erase this. And same story here, and the modulus of i is 1 as well. So all of this evaluates to r, which is a positive real number, and I do not need this huge, um, this huge what is this even called, to be honest? I mean, it's uh, x over y, x by y, x divided by y. But what is exactly this line even called? Anyway, so I didn't need all of it. So I'm just going to write it in a more, uh, this looks a lot more friendly than what we started off with. So, okay, cool. And... We can do something with the denominator as well. We can work something out with the denominator too. Uh, 1 by 1 plus r squared e to the 2i phi. Once you take the modulus, it's well known that this is less than or equal to 1 by r squared minus 1. So you can just replace all of this by the absolute value of r squared minus 1. And you can factor out the r square here. So you get r square outside. Inside you're left with a... 1 and 1 by r squared. So one of the r's cancels out and you're left with uh, the, uh, the, the modulus of the integral over the contour gamma being less than or equal to the integral from 0 to pi of e to the e to the negative r times sine phi. And this exponential is being multiplied by the cosine of r times the cosine of phi divided by r times 1 minus r squared. Integration with respect to phi, of course. Now, in the limit as r goes to infinity, this exponential term up here is going to dominate the discourse, and obviously the integral collapses to zero. So this implies that the integral over gamma in this limit evaluates to zero. So remembering our result that the integral over the closed contour c equaled pi times e to the 1 by e, which equaled the integral over the real line, which was the integral from negative to positive infinity now in the limit of e to the e times ix divided by 1 plus x squared dx plus an integral over the contour gamma, which evaluated to 0. So forget that. And you're left with this pretty awesome looking result. Now the integral that we started off with was in fact the real part of the integral uh, we've just evaluated. And since this integral here is already a real number, we can just drop the real part operator and write i equal pi times e to the 1 by e, which I must say is a wonderful result indeed. So yes, I enjoyed solving the integral, and I really hope you enjoyed the video as well. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.